Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thank you, everyone. I got very excited because you may or may not know that a couple weeks ago, we got some more news about lenacapavir as HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I talked about it once and someone else talked about it from a meeting report a few more weeks ago, but we have more information and we're going to get more information. And I think we're going to be talking about this for a while. Disclosures for that are as of today, only FTC TDF, brand name Truvada, FTC TAF, brand name Discovi, and CAB LA, which is brand name Apertuda, are approved by our U.S. Food and Drug Administration and only for use in some but not all populations. Lenacapavir, which we're going to talk about for prevention, is actually approved for HIV treatment as Sunlenka. And then we're going to talk, of course, about some of the recent research and therefore non-FDA approved strategies for HIV prevention. This is the AETC disclaimer, which I'm not going to read to you. This is the fabulous schematic from the National HIV Curriculum about capsid inhibitors. Lenacapavir, which is the medicine we're gonna be talking about today is a first in class capsid inhibitor. And I'll let you look at this at your leisure, either from my slides or from the curriculum. But what you can see is that uh, capsid inhibitors impact HIV replication and all of the HIV transcription and in various places for the HIV life cycle. This is the dosing that is from the HIV treatment using this medication. There are two regimens that are acceptable for starting lenacapavir. Lenacapavir is a subcutaneous injection. The first one, which I'm showing you on this slide, is exactly the same as what was used in the prevention trial. So that is why I'm showing this to you. People start with pills to 300 milligram tablets on day one and received a subcutaneous injection that is divided into two injections. That is day one. On day two, again, two 300 milligram tablets. And then maintenance dosing for lenacapavir is every six months or so. So different than both cabotegravir, which is every two months after the first couple doses, and even the longer acting cabotegravir, which we are expecting in the next few months to year. So every six month subcutaneous injection. This again is from the treatment approval. This is the alternative dosing regimen for lenacapavir as HIV treatment. There are more doses of the oral tablets on day one, day two, day eight. The first injection happens on day 15 again, then every six month injections. But again, the prior regimen is what has been used in the HIV prevention trials. There are two slides here of all of the purpose trials. These trials are being held by the company that is making lenacapavir. Purpose one was done, and if you were on early, we were just talking about it, it was looking at lenacapavir as the injection versus oral FTC TAF and oral FTC TDF in folks who are assigned female at birth, primarily in South Africa and Uganda. They were anticipating their primary completion in 2024. We'll talk about it. It was stopped early in June of this year. What's new with this talk is that purpose two which was a trial done in cisgender men, of sex with men, transgender men and women, and other gender diverse individuals, was a comparison again, lenacapavir versus only FTC TDF. And that was done in the US and outside the US. This study was stopped at a preliminary data analysis two weeks ago, and I will share what data I have. And then there are two other trials that are enrolling that are smaller, about 250 folks in each one in U.S. cisgender women, and the other in people who inject drugs. And there are other purpose trials that are uh, planned. And I talked with folks from the company yesterday, and all of these other trials and planned trials are actually planned to keep going. 
This is a schematic from AVAC that was shared with me by Hillary with my addition of these two trials that were stopped. Again, purpose one that was done in young girls and other young women and folks assigned female at birth stopped in June. That was reported at the International AIDS Society meeting. And then purpose two, which was stopped two weeks ago and is likely to be presented, I'm guessing, at a research for prevention conference that's going to be in Peru later this year. Probably the manuscript will come out at the same time as the purpose one manuscript, which the next few slides I'm going to show you all the data from. You already have heard this. It's the big zero here that has gotten everybody excited. So this study was stopped early because Lena Kapavir was shown to be superior to both FTAF and FTDF with zero infections over not quite 2,000 person years. We were talking, Rod and I and other folks were talking about this trial, as I've said before, is intended to support the submission of data for FTAF or FDCTAIF to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for approval in populations who are assigned female at birth. You may or may not remember that FTCTAF is currently only approved for folks who are not at risk for HIV acquisition through vaginal or front hole sex. So this data and some other data were, or the study was intended to collect data towards that submission. You can see here, we'll go through this in a little bit, about that there was no difference in comparing uh, the number of HIV infections among folks who received FTAF compared to folks who received FTDF, and then background incidents. And that slide is how background HIV incidence was calculated in this trial and is likely to be calculated moving forward in HIV prevention trials. And the issue is that in this day and age that we cannot compare against placebo, that would be considered unethical. And so there is a citation that I have at the bottom of how they decided what the comparator sort of equivalent baseline or placebo HIV infection would be to compare against the active drug. And this involved looking at the individuals who were being screened for HIV infection as part of the trial. And among those who tested HIV positive using a recency assay, and the one they used was the limiting antigen antibody avidity assay. You don't need to know that specifically for this reason, but just to know that they looked at that, tried to identify who in their population had been recently infected or appeared that way based on this assay, and then tried to calculate what would have been the HIV incidence in this population in individuals who might have received placebo if a placebo was ethical. It's super complicated, which is why I'm not going through all of this math. But just know that the comparison, when we think about whether or not FTC-TF and FTC-TDF were active in this population, this is what we're comparing to. This is looking at that comparison. It's, a, it's just a different way of looking at that slide from two ago that in the top is looking at background incidents and looking at whether Lena Kapavir with its 95% confidence intervals, whether it is truly better than background incidence. And here you obviously with the zero infections, you can clear that that you can clearly see that the 95% confidence interval does not include what would be considered background. But FTC TAF has a point estimate that shows a reduction with confidence intervals that span that incidence with background. This here is a comparison against FTC TDF. And so again, Lena Kapavir with none was shown to be superior. It does not cross this one, whereas FTC TAF, it crosses, it is potentially, the point estimates suggest that there were more infections with a 95% confidence interval that spans both. So the conclusion here is that you cannot say that FTC TAF is any better or worse than FTC TDF in this population. Not surprisingly, you know, this is similar to what we saw with cabotegravir compared to oral PrEP, is that one of the suggestions clearly that the rationale why their superior, superiority 
is that adherence to oral medicines is hard. And what this is, again, this is in purpose one, so that study done with cisgender women, folks who are assigned female birth, that you can see that dark blue is looking at blood samples where it's anticipated that the person's medicine taking was more than four doses a week in that darker blue and the medium blue is two to three doses a week and low medicine taking is less than that. You can see that even at the beginning that in these groups that adherence was not fabulous, less than 50% of folks were thought to be taking more than four pills per week. And that of course decreases over time. This is true both in FTC-TAF and FTC-TDF with perhaps better pill taking in the FTC-TAF group, potentially because of pill size, we don't really know. But in the case control with matched controls, obviously FTC-TAF looks protective among the individuals who had higher adherence. This is nothing surprising, but perhaps this is the data that is going to go to FDA for support of the approval of FDCTF. I just want to comment about side effects. This is, again, looking at purpose one, looking at lenacapavir injections versus the two oral medicines, that in general, when you exclude injection site reactions, that there was no difference in adverse events. There was no difference in serious adverse events. There is obviously a difference in injection site reactions. I was talking yesterday again with the company. There's, it's a very viscous injection, has to be done relatively deep. Otherwise, it can be very irritating. So about 70% of the folks who got active lenacapavir had an injection, at least one injection site reaction compared to those who had placebo injection. And four individuals out of the couple thousand discontinued due to that. So injection site reactions are real adverse event associated with lenacapavir. Again, not surprising. Okay, this is the only information I have about from Purpose 2. Again, there was a brief report. It was then taken down by Gilead, who then I think put up some more disclaimers and some business disclaimers. But this is what's currently available if you Google the Purpose 2 results. Again, study was stopped after an interim analysis in a couple weeks ago. Lenacapavir superior to daily FTC-TDF with that incidence of 0.10 per 100 person years. So two infections in purpose two compared to no individuals receiving active medicine in purpose one. They haven't released the information about who those two people were, whether or not they had actually received their ongoing lenacapavir injections. We don't know that information. I can tell you from purpose one, the um, proportion of the lenacapavir group who received on-time injection, so every six months plus or minus two weeks, that was over 90%. So in general, at least in purpose one, those folks uh, had fairly high adherence to their injections. We have we don't have this information. I expect, again, to see that in the next month or so. Compare this to an incidence of about 1%, about just under one per 100 person years, there were nine infections in the FTC TDF group. TAAF was not included in purpose two because they already have FDA approval for FTC TAF. And again, background calculated the same way that the rate was about twice what that was for the FTC TDF group. The, this sort of simple math calculates to 96% risk reduction. And this is the quote that comes out of that statement on the website, and that is that they're going to begin a series of global regulatory filings by the end of this year supporting the launch of lenacapavir prevention in 2025. They are hoping for a rapid approval, which is estimated to be six months if they get that rapid approval. And that is what I was allowed to share from that. But I think, you know, there are other sort of implementation questions that we we can talk about how how great it is, both of our injectable medicines in preventing HIV, but cost is a monstrous issue. This is information that comes from the clinical guidelines. At the bottom of the slide, I also include there is a single cost effectiveness study looking at 
coverage of lenacapavir and various parameters that they've hypothesized about protection. I didn't want to go into more details because there's a lot of hypothesis in there and it doesn't reflect what we're going to see in the United States, which is what I have here on this slide. And I really want to draw your attention to this column here, which is the average wholesale price of the various medicines. Note that this is monthly. So FTC TAF monthly costs about $2,600. Generic FTC TDF can be as low as $70 a month. This is the treatment cost. Obviously, we don't know what the prevention cost is going to be if it gets FDA approved. But in general, this, so this is your, your startup, and then this is your injection every few months. So thought to be in the $45,000-ish range per year. Comparing to generics of, if we multiply 70 times 12, you get to under $1,000 per year. So cost going to be a huge issue. Whether or not it's going to be covered by insurance, I think we can learn from the cabotegravir implementation how that is going and what lessons we can learn. I had some other questions about lenacapavir. I was sort of curious whether or not since we can access it as treatment, whether people might use it off-label for this. Obviously, it would be hard getting insurance to cover this, but I'd be curious to see if there's any of this. We talked yesterday about you know, adherence monitoring, drug resistance in the tail. If cabotegravir has a tail of over a year on average, how long is the tail going to be and how long do we need to worry about this? Frequency of HIV testing is something we're going to continue to talk about. We've already had conversations about whether or not we should be doing three-month testing at PrEP or whether we can extend that to six months in order to reduce both patient and provider burden. If someone is only coming in every six months for their injections, is there a reason to do it every three months? We don't yet know about the impact of HIV testing results and what HIV testing is going to be recommended for folks. I assume that the FDA is going to insist on HIV RNA testing along with this, but we don't know. We haven't talked about medication interactions. Lenacavir is reduced by any of the strong CYP3A inducers. I sort of am intrigued by the idea of home in administration of this because it is subcutaneous, whereas intramuscular injections are essentially impossible or very hard to do by oneself. And then, of course, insurance coverage. So those are my questions, but I'm sure there are other questions out there as we start to have more and more conversations about lenacapavir. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.